The Remedyverse is one of the strangest game universes ever made. I mean, it started with a game back in 2010 that honestly wasn't really that good. But I think the lackluster gameplay and occasionally weak performances were kind of distracting from a genuinely good, layered, and sometimes confusing story. There was also the abomination that is Alan Wake's American Nightmare after the original with their decent DLCs. And then obviously Quantum Break was its own thing, but then Control comes out, and Control is just a completely different type of game. Somehow a bit similar to the off-kilter nature of the original Alan Wake, but a little more sterile and mundane in a good way. And now we come to Alan Wake 2, the sequel to the 2010 game. Now obviously after Control, we're expecting this game to look great, to play smoothly, and for the story to build upon the previous game, but it does so much more than all of that. If we're being honest here, Alan Wake is the prologue, Alan Wake 2 is the real deal. We'll start with the story and lore, which is obviously the meat and potatoes of this game. Uh, it's extremely good. It kind of straddles the line between confusing and simple. The stuff you need to know is made pretty clear if you're paying proper attention throughout the whole thing, especially if you play the final draft, more on that later. But obviously, there are two main halves to the story. Alan Wake's and Saga Anderson's. Saga's side is a bit less confusing and more traditionally formatted. We basically are trying to find out why the Cult of the Tree is doing what they're doing and why reality is changing because of Alan Wake's books, and how to get Alan out of the dark place to fix everything later on. As we further investigate the Cult of the Tree, we get reveals like who's a part of it, why people are turning into Taken, and why Saga has been resistant to the changing reality and memory issues. We also go into overlaps, which are areas where the dark place and reality cross over a bit. We also get a lot of information on the other characters, which we don't really get on Alan Wake's side, like Tor and Odin having special powers as Andersons and that they're related to Saga. Cynthia Weaver from the last game tragically has become taken, and her angel lamp was stolen and given to Alan in the Dark Place by Rose, more on Rose later. Barry Wheeler has become the agent of the old gods of Asgard, but has been extremely distraught since the last game. Agent Nightingale has also become taken after a failed ritual from the Cult of the Tree. And finally, Alex Casey as the most book character of the book characters. Saga's side has more characters and does more to fill in the lore of the universe, why things are the way they are, and answer questions for the audience, especially those who didn't play the original game. Perversely, we have Wake's side. Wake has significantly fewer characters. It's Wake, Door, Breaker, Alice, and Scratch who's on both sides of the story anyway. Our journey with Wake is almost a catch-up of what's been going on the past 13 years. What we play in the story is the most recent loop in the Dark Place, but it's used to fill in the blanks between now and what happened before this game. Like Alan believing Alice died because Scratch wouldn't stop haunting her, and him refusing to write because he then believed he didn't deserve to escape. This is your reminder to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you. Now, for this game, it's extremely difficult to discuss what happens in the story because about 25% of it and some of the most important parts are only implied and not shown. For example, it's said that Alex Casey was originally not created by Wake stories, but it's not said how he would have ended up in those stories if Alan didn't know him. It's seemingly implied as best as I can tell that some of the echoes of reality that Alan sees influence his writing. That's why the Casey in the Dark Place looks and sounds like Casey in real life but I don't think that's ever said out loud. Same thing with the bullet of light coming from Alice and how it ends up at the Parliament Tower in general. But anyway, I'll try. There's four main areas in this game. The towns of Bright Falls and Watery, Cauldron Lake, and the Dark Place slash New York and some smaller areas in there. We'll start with Alan and go back to Saga later. I think Remedy games have all struggled a little bit to get people emotionally invested in characters, but this game is learning from those mistakes though, because you actually kind of care about Alan and Saga's story a bit. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think anyone understood 100% of the story of this game on their first playthrough, and I think that's mostly because of Alan's side. His is the most confusing and even sometimes frustrating. We start off his side with him being in the dark place after we just rescued him as Saga. He's on a talk show for some reason talking about the book that Saga's in that he doesn't remember writing. Convoluted start, to say the least. We're introduced to Warland Dor, who if you weren't paying attention, you probably don't know who this guy is. I mean, he's probably Saga's father, but that's only implied. And for some reason, Tim Breaker is also in the dark place. Again, not a ton of actual facts known outside of the DLC as to why Tim and Dor are opponents, but that doesn't really matter much to Alan in this game, so. We're basically astral projecting from the writer's room into initiation, which is basically New York in the dark place, which Alan is writing as the sequel to Departure Before Return. Each draft of initiation out of the three total is set in a different murder ritual somewhere in New York. Because Alan's been getting visions of the real world, a lot of his characters look and sound like real people from Bright Falls and Watery. The first site is a train station, which kind of gets you used to the mechanics of the writer's room and the angel lamp. The second is a hotel, which is my favorite murder site personally. And the final is a movie theater playing Thomas Zane's new film. After we do all those and get to Parliament Tower to learn things a few times, to sum up, 
Alan's trying to edit Scratch's book, which is Return, to help Saga out in the real world, which is Return. But then, Scratch shows up to Parliament Tower and shoots Alan before he can finish editing the book. I'm pretty sure that doesn't actually kill Alan because that's a projection of him, so he starts on the next draft. And then learns that Alice could not take Scratch's harassment and bit the dust, so to speak. Alan, having learned this, goes to the writer's room where Scratch is and shoots him. This is the loop and tells us how Scratch and Alan work. There is a Scratch. Alan becomes Scratch when he learns of Alice's passing, and then he's brought to the real world in the past by Saga from the future doing a summoning ritual. Alan's not Scratch at first because being outside the dark place keeps the dark presence at bay for a bit, especially because Alan forgets a ton of what just happened. So, at the summoning ritual, Alan is Scratch again, but we get the dark presence out of him, but then it goes into Casey. Casey Scratch throws Saga into the dark place and her mind place, and Alan has to get his gear back and go after Casey Scratch. And then I think we arrive at the most emotionally poignant moment in the entire game, and I want to slow down a bit for it. I don't think people realize that beneath the madness and convolution of this game's story, it's sad. Like, really sad. Alan, as written by Zane, as written by Alan or some such, comes to Bright Falls to get away from it all. His wife ends up in the lake and he immediately jumps in to help her. In doing this, he began this loop. We are talking about a man that's been punished for over a decade with an art form that he used to enjoy. We're talking about a man that functionally loses his wife even though his dedication to her is what began all of this. And he's not just trying to escape the dark place, he's also trying to save everyone while remaining adamant for most of the game that he's not a hero. 13 years of going insane and writing into oblivion. 13 years of watching himself go insane later in the loop. And at the end of it all, Casey Scratch is winning, and Alan finds himself running right back into the nightmare dimension in a fate worse than death just to save everyone but himself. And he knows this, he knows he has no hope for escape, he knows that no one will care that he saved the world, but at the end of the day, he has to do it. He gets one taste of the real world for a day or so, then it's back into the nightmare. This is your reminder to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you. And originally, he does lose. It's not a loop, it's a spiral, the final line of the game. Could mean a lot of things. But functionally, he's forced to keep going through this until the dark presence finally wins. Psychological torment until he bites the dust, so to speak. Until we get to one of the biggest problems with this game, the final draft. Now, I obviously played Alan Wake 2 more recently, so I played the final draft the same day as finishing the initial story. We're talking 10 minutes of new story for 15 to 20 hours of another playthrough, at least on Nightmare. It's a bit of a joke, and the actual ending of the game is quite literally not shown to people until months after it came out. There's a lot of issues with this. One, the new ending gives us way more questions than answers. Apparently now Alan may have the same power as Dor or the Master of Many Worlds. The Dark Presence may or may not be gone because Alan's clearly alive, so I don't see why the Dark Presence couldn't be alive, and even though the main characters are all still in the real world, Alice, the Old Gods, and Breaker are all still in the Dark Place while Dor's whereabouts remain unknown. And we knew about half of this in the original ending. Look, I get it. This is a business, and they needed to maintain hype for this game months after release. That's not the issue. The issue is how little extra content is put in the game. A couple of extra manuscript pages, some live-action teases of Dr. Darling and Zane, and the new ending. That's just about it. I love this game more than most, but this stuff just should have been in the game on release. But... We still gotta discuss Saga side of things. Like I said before, we're actually getting good emotional beats. I mean, at the beginning of the game, Saga and Casey are just FBI agents trying to solve a case. If anything, their investigation into overlaps and rituals and Taken is really just them doing their jobs. But when Saga's daughter is put on the table, it becomes clear that she has an emotional attachment to this case being solved. She has to get Alan the clicker so he can change reality and make things go back to normal. Along the way, she discovers that even though reality has been manipulated, she actually is related to Odin and Tor, even if she never moved to Watery when her parents passed like everyone claims. She also meets Ilmo and Yako Koskula, who are basically the leaders of the townspeople and the cult. And we eventually find out that the brothers are not evil devil worshippers or followers of Scratch, they're just killing Taken before they can attack the town and trying to kill Wake so reality stops changing. Obviously, they are criminals, but they're not psychopaths, and it's worth mentioning that their commercials are genuinely some of the best parts of the game, akin to Darling's videos in Control. Also, this is an extra little side note, but when you get to the Eternal Deer Fest and you see Ilmo on screen without his brother Yako, it's actually quite disturbing. It's clear from Ilmo's body language that being without Yako is so fundamentally wrong. These feelings even penetrate the force of the dark presence. Again, it's just another emotional beat for a company that's not used to having them. And I appreciate it a lot, it adds a lot of stakes to the ending of the game. As for Odin and Tor, they're pretty good. 
They're usually used for comedic effect, but they're not like the funniest characters, but I like the relationship they have with the Dark Place and Saga and how their story culminates at the end of this game. And then there's Casey and Estevez, and I do not know how to feel about either of these characters. I like Casey and his performance the entire game, rest in peace James McCaffrey, but he's either absent or forced into parts that he shouldn't be and it's really distracting. Like when he just gets lost in the forest at the beginning of the game. I know they come up with an excuse as to why, but come on. I think it's because you don't fight with an AI companion the entire game. I mean, it's horror. It works better when your character is alone. But they just needed better ways to keep Casey busy. They make him go missing like twice across the game. Once when he gets lost and once when the FEC has to find him. And then he returns off screen. Estevez is cool. I think there's an extremely appropriate amount of FEC in general in this game, although she barely has enough screen time to be a side character. She's only funny half of the time that she's making a joke. But still, I think her inclusion is fine. But then there's Saga herself, who is probably the least interesting part of the return segments of the story. Like, her father is, allegedly, Warland door who can access other dimensions without even trying and her mother and grandfather have psychic abilities. And she inherits these abilities, sure, but I don't know. I think that she just doesn't do very much, again, apart from the end, to make me feel for her. The game doesn't really lean enough into the motherly love that she should be exhibiting for Logan. It makes it come off a bit like Saga just wants to solve the case and meet her grandfather and great uncle, which isn't doing much for her character. And that's actually something I want to discuss. Saga's actress's performance. Usually in reviews like these, it's kind of in bad taste to blame an accomplished actor or actress for a flat performance, but I don't think I can help myself here. Apart from hearing her accent slip through every other sentence, I just never see an expression on her face or something in her voice that's telling me what she's feeling. It's always what she's saying to the audience and not what she's showing. Except at the end, when she's trapped in her mind place, she's just very flat the entire game. And it works with a protagonist like Jesse Faden, who's extremely cynical and dry and nearly self-aware of the type of game she's in. Saga does not have that same personality. But that's just my opinion on a performance that everyone else seems to praise, so I don't know. But when she's acting opposite Alan Wake's Matthew Peretta, it comes off a lot more egregious. Back to the story itself, we get most of the boss fights on Saga's side and most of the twists. We learn that Alan was Scratch the whole time when he escaped the Dark Place, and then we learn that Scratch doesn't exist and it's just a corrupted Alan. And we learn that the Cult of the Tree is actually benign and that Odin and Tor are related to Saga and a couple of others. I think the story itself and the lion's share of gameplay carries Saga's side while the emotional beats and more cerebral gameplay carry Alan's. And I think that's why it's much harder to get emotionally attached to Saga. Her parts of the game aren't really about her besides the Coffee World segment. Something else on her side is always the center of attention. The FBC, the Old Gods, Casey, the Cult, and whatever evidence she's putting together with a blank face in the Mind Place. But this is all kind of excused by the culmination of her side of the game. She's trapped in the Mind Place and is twisted into not wanting to fight and believing she's a bad detective, partner, and mother. You hear some semblance of actual emotion from Saga's actress as she panics and berates herself verbally and I'm just left wondering where any of this range was in the entire game. However, this segment does do a great job of making us care about Casey, Logan, and Saga from all the evidence lying around. It's not as good as the end of Alan's story, but it's not chopped liver, it's actually very good. As for the DLC, it's good fun, but I just hope that the lake house is a little more heavy on the lore. But Night Springs was fun in itself. It was fun to see Jesse again after a few years, and a little more lore on Tim Breaker, even if it's not all canonical, is good. I think the weakest is probably Roses, but it's not by much. As for the gameplay of this game, it's pretty much just a Resident Evil game, and I don't even want to discuss it that much because of how simple it is. That said, it's good. A lot of square footage of exploration for Saga, and a lot of depth in the areas were given for Alan. I mean, every single plot element at a murder site can apply to every single scene, which is actually quite impressive. And there are entire areas that you need to visit as Saga or you're just not going to get any upgrades or charms in your playthrough. For Alan, the need to shine your flashlight at every surface in the game, for words of power, is counterbalanced by not disturbing any of the shadows. Although I think that there are a touch too many echoes, especially because if you go too far from them, they restart. The gameplay is good, but the combat itself is a little generic. So, when all is said and done and the problems are all on the table, how good is it? It's extremely good. I really just want to ignore every problem with this game because it's quickly secured its spot in my top 5, but I can't. And that's the most disappointing part. It's extremely good, definitely an 8.5 out of 10, but it loses that last point and a half from what comes as a weak performance from Saga's actress. It's just not acceptable when she makes up half of the game, although I'm trying to give her the benefit of the doubt on that. And locking the ending of a story that was clearly ready at release behind a half of a year of waiting is insulting. You can't be a perfect game and have a co-lead that's not cutting it, and you especially can't lock an ending to your game behind several months of waiting. 
and then you slap three extra minutes of footage on the game and call it a day. It just doesn't work. I get that it's supposed to feed into the spiral and loop aspect of the game, but at the very least it should have been there on release. It sucks too because I want so badly to give this game a 10 out of 10. I love this game. I love Howland Wake 2, I'm willing to say that. And after 13 years, I think it would have been fitting to give this game a 10 out of 10, but unfortunately it has to get an 8.5. But honestly, most of that stuff's forgiven from the musical segments of the game. Herald of Darkness and Dark Ocean Summoning, along with a couple of other really good songs that are just in the background of this game, which is kind of crazy on its own, is really cool. Anyway, if you enjoyed, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. I would definitely appreciate it. Though or not, that's fine. Play nice people.